Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we will be continuing with The Fall of Hyperion by Dan Simmons. This novel is the second in his Hyperion Cantos series and this is part six. For the first five parts of this novel, there will be a link to a playlist at the end of the video. Included in that playlist will be the first novel, Hyperion. Before we begin, subscribe, give us a like, drop us a comment, and now, part six. When Joseph woke up, he had been asleep for ten minutes. He brought Monsignor Edward and Father Paul up to date with what he saw going on with Gladstone back at Tor City Center and the pilgrims back at Hyperion. The fact that Gladstone was thinking of putting people in the labyrinths for safety frightened them because of what Father Paul saw when he was there. Father Dure was planning to go to God's Grove to speak with the Templars and then join Joseph back in Tor City when he was finished. Joseph was planning to head straight to Tor City to see Gladstone. And the Monsignor had to stay at Passam for the funeral of His Holiness and the election of a new Holy Father. And as they were leaving, Lee Hunt showed up to see Joseph, saying it was important. When Hunt saw Joseph, he told him that the CEO wanted to see him right away. Hunt told him that he had found him because he was using the override card that Gladstone had given him. They punched in the code for Tor Seti in the forecaster and stepped through. Once they were through, they realized that they weren't on Tor City and tried to turn back and head back for the portal, but by then it had disappeared. The first thing Joseph noticed was that his access to the data sphere was gone, and Hunt's calm log was not working. Joseph quickly realized that the forecaster did not malfunction, that they were where the technical wanted them. When Hunt asked Joseph where they were, Joseph said he believed they were either on Old Earth or its duplicate. Hunt came to the conclusion that there was something that Joseph knew that the Technicord did not want Gladstone to find out about. They began walking, looking for another forecaster that they could use. Meanwhile, somewhere up time, Colonel Kassad was attacking the Shrike. The Shrike was able to get through his skin suit field and rip his flesh open on his leg. Kassad managed to knock the Shrike down, but then the Shrike was able to counterattack and sever his Achilles tendon. The fight continued, but the Shrike got the upper hand, and just as it was about to bite off Kassad's face, Moneta stepped in to help. She had attacked the Shrike from the back. It threw her off, and Kassad faced it once again, and he heard cheering. It was the people that were on the tree of thorns that was sharing for him. Then suddenly, the shrike appeared right next to Kassad. It wrapped its arms around him and opened its jaws, and Kassad struck at it. Father Dure, meanwhile, had gotten to God's grove, and the Templars were waiting for him. He was taken to meet two people. The first was the true voice of the world tree, and the high priest of the shrike cult. Dure asked the bishop of the shrike cult, why the riots? And the bishop answered him, saying, The final days are here. The prophecies given to us by the avatar centuries ago are unfolding before our eyes. What you call riots are the first death throes of a society which deserves to die. The days of atonement are upon us, and the Lord of pain will soon walk among us. Do we ask why are the Templars and the Shrike Church working together? The true voice told him that the Church of the Final Atonement touch on their mission from the Moer. He says only these prophecies have held the key to what punishment must befall humankind for killing its own world. When he said it was an accident, the Templar told him it was arrogance, human arrogance, the same arrogance that caused them to destroy all species that might even hope to evolve to intelligence someday. Both the Templars and the Shrike Church believe that humans are doomed and that the Shrike is here to provide that punishment. Then Dewey told them that have they not thought that maybe those prophecies are not divine revelations but manipulations of a secular power. When he was asked what power could do this, 
he pointed out to them that every world in the web is joined by the technocourse data sphere for generations, that most people carry a cam log and extension implants for ease of accessing. He goes on to tell them that the technocore has created a transcendent intelligence, that their goal is to eliminate humans, and that the big mistake may have been deliberately executed by AIs, that the Shrike may just be here to slaughter humans for this machine's personality's own goal. The bishop, of course, got pissed off and refused to believe that. Dure then asked the Templar why was Hetmastin sent. The Templar told him that Hetmastin had volunteered. He was sent so that he could take an erg when his ship was destroyed and use it to fly a new tree ship, the one that they call the Tree of Atonement, the Tree of Thorn. After they had answered his question, they asked him one. They wanted to know what happened to the mother, the mother of their salvation, the one they call Brani Lamia. Once he had told them all he knew about Brani, the bishop left. Then Sek Hardin, who was the voice of the world tree, told him that if he was a Templar, he would be put to death for his heresy about the machine misleading them for generations. When Dewey turned to leave, Sek Hardin wouldn't let him. He told him that in 18 minutes, the world of Heaven's Gate will fall to the ousters, and our prophecies say it will be destroyed. Certainly, it's far cast the will. And the prophecies also say that in an hour, the ouster worship will come to God's grove, and everyone there will perish, and the end will be swift and painless. So there was nothing Father Dewey could do but wait. After walking for a day, Hunt and Joseph found an inn where someone had set out food for them, and there was fire in the fireplace. All this while they hadn't seen a single person in all the time that they were there. Hunt was pretty upset and unnerved by all of this. He asked Joseph if he was sure he couldn't access the data sphere. Joseph said he couldn't, but Joseph never told him that he may be able to access the megasphere. Later that night, Joseph woke up coughing and feeling wetness on his chest. When he turned on the light and looked, he spotted blood on his skin, spotting the bedclothes. When Hunt asked him what the matter was, he told Hunt that he has tuberculosis, the final stages. It was the same thing that the original John Keats had died of. When Hunt said that the core can't keep them on this empty world now with no medical assistance, Joseph said, that may be precisely why I'm being kept here. The next morning there was a carriage and a horse outside the inn waiting for them. Hunt had a difficult time believing it because horses are extinct and were never brought back into existence. The carriage didn't have any reins and there was no coachman. And so they wondered if the horse knows the way. So they got on and the horse began moving. Meanwhile, Mina Gladstone was asking one of her aides where Hunt and Joseph was. And she was told there was still no word. Gladstone replied that that was impossible because Joseph had a tracer and Hunt had stepped through to pass him almost an hour ago. She was told that security can't find them and the transit police can't locate them. And the forecaster unit said that they coded for TC2, which is Tor City Center, but they stepped through but didn't arrive. And she was told that's impossible. But she was told, yes, that's what happened. She then said after the meeting she wants to speak to Albedo or one of the other AI counselors. They went back to monitoring the attack, which was to begin on Heaven's Gate in four minutes. And as the attack began, the force destroyed the Farcaster portals to Heaven's Gate. The only information they would get from Heaven's Gate now would be by fat line transmitters only. It was the first time in 400 years that the hegemony had lost a world. That means that Heaven's Gate was now nine years away from the nearest web world. Seven months ship time. They watched Heaven Gate via fat line until they lost that capability. There were 86,789 people left on Heaven's Gate, not counting the 12,000 force marines that were there. And as they were discussing whether the ousters will want to negotiate once they've taken the nine web worlds, that's when they got fat line 
transmissions from Heaven's Gate, the planet itself, that showed that the planet was being attacked. They watched as Heaven's Gate was destroyed until they lost all fat line communications with the planet itself. They now believed that this was all out war and they wondered what they should do now and they all looked to Gladstone for answers. Meanwhile, on Hyperion, the console survived the crash and he pulled Theo Lane from the wreckage. Theo was unconscious and he watched as the city burned. Once Theo came through, the console told him he knew where they were. They weren't far from Cicero and that's where they headed. When they got to Cicero's, it was burning, and the owner, Stan Lewiski, was helping put it out. The council asked Stan for some help to use his phone or his calm log so they can get to the spaceport, but he didn't have anything. The calm log bands were jammed and the phone was gone. That's when Dr. Emilio Arundes said he had a skimmer and he was willing to help. The council recognized him as Rachel's friend. They got on the skimmer and they headed for the spaceport. They got to the spaceport and with Theo's help, they were able to get onto the spaceport and onto the console's ship. Once on the ship, they put Theo into the ship's surgery tank of emergency care. He told the ship to take off and head to the time tombs, but it told him it was required to share this fat line transmission first. And he asked it, Whose commands do you respond to? The ship told him, CEO Gladstone, sir. She has override priority. The message was from Gladstone. She said that she was pleased that he survived the visit to the time tombs and that by now he must know that she is asking him to negotiate with the ousters before he returns to the valley. She told him, while you can't help Rachel, you can still help billions of people in the web. She wants him to go and negotiate with the ousters to help stop this war. She has warned the ousters that he is coming to negotiate with them, although they haven't responded. And she wants him to do that before he goes to the Valley of the Time Tombs. The council really does not want to do what Gladstone says. He wants to go straight to the Time Tombs, but Milio has convinced him otherwise. Just then the ship had to take off because the spaceport's northern parameter was breached. Then the ship headed for the ouster swarm, broadcasting its intentions on all frequencies. The console and Arundes noted on the time that it was six minutes until the precise instant of Rachel's birth. Joseph and Hunt were headed for Rome, and as they got closer, Joseph got sicker. By this time, he was vomiting up blood. It was evening by the time they got to Rome, and it was Rome of a 19th century Earth. Hunt was afraid. He wanted to know why would the Corps bring them here? What did they want? Joseph didn't tell him, but he believed that they wanted him to die, that they wanted to see him die, and they wanted Hunt to watch. Joseph took them to the Spanish steps, to number 26, Piazza de Spagna. Meanwhile, Saul stood at the entrance of the Sphinx, waiting for the Shrike to bring his daughter back. He tried entering the Sphinx, but the light coming out of it kept him from going in. When he turned and looked at the other tombs, each of them were glowing. He saw someone moving at the entrance of the jade tomb, so he headed over there. At first he thought it was Rachel, but when he got closer, he saw that it was Brani. He caught her just as she fell, and although he was disappointed that it wasn't Rachel, he told her, it's all right, she's back. Mina Gladstone was on Mons Olympus, Mars. That's where the war room was. Her aide, Sedeptra, told her that there was still no word from Lee Hunt or Joseph Severn, and that the Corps said it may have been a forecaster malfunction, which, of course, Gladstone did not believe. She said, can you remember any forecaster malfunction in our lifetime? Sedeptra responded, no. Gladstone goes on to say, the Corps feels no need for subtlety. Evidently, they think that they can kidnap whomever they want and not be held accountable. They think we need them too much and that they're right. She said that her meeting with Councillor Albido will be right after her meeting in the war room, but Sedaptra thinks that it was too risky to confront them like that because they may disappear her the way they did with Lee and Severn. But she says she doesn't think they will 
because they think things have gone too far that an individual can do nothing to change the course of events, and they may be right. On God's Grove, the true voice of the world tree, Sek Hardin, and Father Paul Dure was waiting. As they waited for the ouster ships to come, Sek Hardin said that they have asked Gladstone and the hegemony to offer no resistance and to allow no force warships in the system. In the discussions, Hardin said that humans are like a cancer on the universe, that they have eradicated countless life forms and competing forms of intelligent life. He goes on to say that this insanity came from a symbiosis between humans and a technocore. And while Dure asked if they are willing to see billions of people die to accomplish this weeding out, Hardin was confident that that would not occur, that the ouster was seeking only to control Hyperion and the Shrike long enough to strike at the Technocore. He was also confident that God's Grove would not be attacked. That's why he's keeping Dure there, so he could report that fact to the hegemony. Dure asked him how he knew all this, and just as the Templar was about to respond, that's when the bombs began dropping on God's Grove. And as the forest was going up in flames, Hardin was shocked. He said they promised, the ouster brethren promised. Hardin then brought the forecaster portal into existence and dragged Dure towards it and pushed Dure through the portal just as the fire reached it. It shut down just as Dure tumbled through, slicing off the heel of his shoe. Dure felt his eardrums rupture and his clothes began to smolder and he fell, hitting his head, knocking himself unconscious. Gladstone and her war cabinet watched as God's Grove was destroyed. They quickly destroyed the singularity connecting them to God's Grove. Mare Infinitus was the next planet that was going to be attacked in 3 hours and 52 minutes. They were going to send Admiral Lee with a task force of 74 ships to hit the ouster swarm in the Oort Cloud away from Mare Infinitus. Just then, someone came and informed Gladstone that Father Paul Dore had just come to a fast caster, but he was severely injured and that he was taken to the infirmary. She adjourned the meeting for 30 minutes and she sent her aide to put two guards to protect the priest. Another aide told her that the Senate has the votes for a no confidence of this administration. They just don't know it yet. And she has about 72 hours on the outside. She then met with Councillor Albedo, asking him to tell her where the Technocore was located. He refused to tell her, and he defended the Corps' predictions, although the Corps never predicted all of these worlds being destroyed. She then decided that she wanted to speak to someone of higher authority of the Technocore, and not him. She then called up a forecaster so that she could go and visit Paul Dure at the infirmary, but just before she stepped through, she realized that the Technocor controlled the Farcaster and therefore controlled every human being in the web and that they could kill her quite easily. But then she stepped through anyway. Joseph and Hunt took two rooms on the second floor and Joseph's room was the smaller of the two. Joseph was very sick at this time. He had a fever and he was coughing up blood. Joseph finally fell asleep and dreamt that he was in a megasphere, a portion of it where he's never been before. Finally, Hunt woke him because he heard him crying out in his sleep. Then Hunt asked him about this place and said, obviously this is something to do with him. And he told him to tell him about it. So he told him about the poet John Keats, his birth in 1795, his short and unhappy life, and about his death in 1821. He told him about how he woke up in this room and decided to take the name Joseph Severn. He then told Hunt about his dreams, how he dreamt about Gladstone, the destruction of Heaven's Gate and God's Grove, and what he saw on Hyperion. Then Hunt wanted to know if he couldn't contact them, speak to them through his dreams. But Joseph replied, no, he can't. Besides, what good would they do? By now, Gladstone doesn't trust the core. She would know that they were the ones that kidnapped them. Hunt then asked for him to recite a John Keats poem, which he did. And before 
going to sleep Hunt told him no more nightmares. Moneta pulled Kassad, who was severely wounded, away from the shrike. His right foot was dangling and he couldn't put any weight on it. She brought up a golden oval and pulled him through it. He knew she had taken him somewhere through time and space. The skies were so filled with stars and galaxies that there was no dark spots in the sky. It was as bright as daylight. He believed that maybe he was in the center of the galaxy. He saw some men and women in skin suits. One of the men came up to them and was speaking to Moneta. He could tell that they were speaking, although he couldn't hear anything. The man deactivated his skin suit and began touching him, and then he passed out. And when he came through, Moneta was whispering to him, and his skin suit was back, and he was healed. He thanked the man and then looked at the people that was around him. They were all human, but there was a great variety among them. The man who healed him was huge, but next to him was a small, tiny woman with wings. There were women who had webbed fingers and men who were armor-plated. And above them, flying, were some winged males who had lasers coming out of an eye in their chest. Monata then told him it was time for them to go, that these people had enough to worry about. And when he asked where they were, she said, Far in the future of humanity, one of our futures, this is where the time tombs were formed and launched backward in time. Monata then took him back through the golden oval, back to the crystal monolith in the valley of the tombs. He looked and he saw Saul bending over Brani Lamia. Monata warned him, if he fight again, the Shrike will kill him, because she saw the Shrike heading towards Saul and Brani. He told her that they are his friends, and he grabbed his weapons and charged down to meet it. Joseph woke up. Hunt was still asleep. He pulled a chair over to the window and sat and thought of the last time he was here. He also thought of what he dreamed. Martin Silenus on the tree, Kassar preparing to fight the Shrike, the cries of the consul as he is forced into betrayal a second time. He thought of the Templars and the world dying, of Brani Lamia, of Paul Dewey, of Saul, who was crying for his daughter. He then went and lay down to sleep. Theolene woke up hearing music. He realized he was on the ship, and he went looking for the consul, who he found playing a piano. The ship was open, there was gravity, and there was sunlight. Milio was nearby listening, and below the ship's balcony on a green lawn was clusters of people, and these people were like none he had ever seen in the web. They were of different types. They were obviously designed for different worlds and different environments. Milio saw him and whispered, Ousters. Once the console has finished playing, the people all applauded and got up and left in their various ways. The council greeted him, saying he was just in time that they'll be negotiating soon. That's when three oysters landed on the balcony and folded their wings. They had fur and were differently marked and striped. After they introduced Theo, they said that they would send a boat for them to begin the negotiations and left. When Theo asked the council what are they going to negotiate, he said that depends on Gladstone's next message. Meanwhile, Gladstone had gone to visit Father Dure, who was recovering from his burns. He told her that the true voice did not believe that the ousters would attack, but they did. He then told her about his passage to the labyrinth and how he met with Joseph and Hunt and Passam and how they left to come back to visit her. She informed him that they were missing and she wanted him to stay with her. And she received a message from Passam saying that the Catholic Church had elected a new Pope and he was the new Pope. She then put a call through from the Monsignor, then stepped out to send a message to the Consul's ship. She asked him to find out why the ousters are attacking and destroying worlds of the web. Then she wanted to know where the Technicore was located because they may have to fight them. She also wanted to know what was their demands for a ceasefire, and if the leader of the swarm would be willing to meet her in person. 
then she says that the swarm leader must know that the core wants them to use the death wand and that they will not allow the ouster invasion to overrun the web. She then sent the message saying it is up to you now. Once the consul got the message, he sent back an acknowledgement. He then brought Theo up to date on his betrayal and how he got to be here. Then Milio, Theo, and the consul watched as the boat that was sent for them approached. We will stop here and continue this in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.